Hello, LA Progressive friends, family readers. Dick and I are delighted to once again be joined with uh, Reverend Peter Lorman. Uh, um, Peter is a retired uh, minister who formerly led Progressive Christians Uniting here in Los Angeles. And uh, now he um, is spending his leisurely time writing some really heavy duty material that he graciously allows us to publish here at the LA Progressive. Peter, welcome. Hey, it's good to be here. And speaking of gracious, thank you so much for letting me into your studio. I should say, I should probably change my line and say, ministers never quite retire. They just hang around and annoy other ministers. <laughs> well, you wrote a really great piece, Peter. Um, it's in the LA Progressive. It's of presidents and predation, why Biden's debt relief pitch won't move the needle. And that's what we're going to be talking to you uh, today about this piece. So I can start. Go ahead, Dickel. So, so uh, a part of the thing is you point the point to the obvious issue that the Biden campaign is rousing very little interest, and in all his talk about uh, perfectly good things, uh, uh, removing student debt, uh, the infrastructure bill, are, are are wonderful things, but they they aren't generating any passion among anybody. And he really ought to talk about the uh, the core issues of rampant capitalism uh, and the and the entire system. How how do you think he would do that? Well, I I, I wrestle with that because uh, in part he's not ideologically inclined to do it. Uh, I don't know if I say this, uh, but I think maybe I do. You know, as a senator for 30 years, more than that, he represented Delaware, which is where the credit card companies are. So the whole idea of being opposed to this structure of using debt to trickle wealth upward is uh, somewhat alien to his thinking. I also think I didn't say this. I, I, I referenced the contrast to Franklin Roosevelt, whom Biden admires, who did, in fact, go for the viscera and who did inflame class passions of people who were being screwed by the upper class, his class, he was such an aristocrat that he could do this. You know, he could be a traitor to his class, you know, and to Groton and Harvard. He's a Roosevelt, for God's sakes. Um, but, you know, he could campaign and say, hey, these guys are screwing you. I mean, this is the Great Depression uh, with a third of the nation, as he put it, ill-housed, Ill ill-fed, Ill -fed, ill clothed. Um, but still, he was unapologetic in saying uh, th this is an oppressive system. Um, uh, the, the the bankers and and speculators have uh, have ruined all of us. And then he you know quoted or didn't quote exactly, but he echoed the language of the Bible and said they fled the temple. The, the temple's been cleansed of the cleansed of these polluters. Now maybe we can restore democracy. That was really interesting because obviously not a Marxist, Franklin Roosevelt. He's 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 saying really clearly that this kind of out of control capitalism and fundamental democracy are at odds. I think that's something that most of our uh, 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 neighbors don't quite understand, you know, because uh, predatory capitalism is so normalized. It's so ingrained. It's just how it works. If you need money, you borrow it. Right, right. You, you know, not really I mean, you know, and the money is there. Hey. You know, the money is there. You sign on the dotted line. Um, the interest is 200 percent in uh, by law in, in Rhode Island, you know, payday loans. And you do that. And the people who aren't paying 200 percent are paying 10 percent. I have a really good friend in Los Angeles who took out a you know, private loan for uh, uh, his education, uh, a, a high end culinary education. Um, I know about this because, you know, I, I backed him up in making this application. Last time I checked it, you know, the, his rate was 10%. And, you know, he, he had paid more over the course of this loan, I think over a six-year period in uh, fees and whatever, interest and stuff, than uh, the entire sum of the, of the loan. That's not unusual. That's not unusual. But the whole system rests on the fact that uh, people who need to work who don't profit from invested funds, who need to work, don't get paid enough, and the people who get paid 
in the form of what the tax code, thank God, still calls unearned income, investment income, um, uh, make out. And that's really the story of our economy for 50 years. A long time ago, somebody in, in these times wrote an essay about how the union card got exchanged for a credit card. Yeah, yeah. So that is, you, you're, you're right, Peter, we agree with you. That is the story that the unearned income folk seem to be valued more if you determine that value is tied to how much they are compensated. Um, and you look at the, the wage earners are valued less as human beings if you determine that their value is, is determined by um, their wages. And, and you make a point by saying that the Democrats and Biden do not are not truthful about how this economy works. And then you talk about FDR. And I'm with you all the way there, except that with FDR, as great as he was a president um, serving um, almost four complete terms, he was not so great when it came to Black people, well, people of color. And so this economy, the American economy, the foundation of it is racist capitalism, let's be honest. And how do we expect that Biden would ever be honest about that when his, his whole career has been funded? by the deep pockets of those who, that's how they make their money. How could he ever be honest? Right, and not just Biden, but I think we really need to say the whole uh, establishment of the Democratic Party. I mean, I vote Democratic all the time, um, and all the time I do, I think to myself, wow, the system is so broken. Uh, I don't know who was in Radio City Music Hall for the $25 million fundraiser in New York recently where the three presidents were there, you know, the bros with their open <laughs> shirts. Please wear a necktie if you're presidents. Never mind, that's an editorial. Um, <laughs> uh, but, they, you know, uh, I know that the ringside seats, you know, in the private audience uh, with the presidents is like, uh, I don't know, $500,000. And people pay that. Think about that. Think about the number of people at the top of the economy for whom a quarter million, half a million dollar contribution is no big deal. And, you know, I try to say in the article, not very well. I think the mass of people in the country are dimly aware of that. I think they really know that in contrast to Trump world of Trump, where the, the oppressors are cultural elites, I think most people understand that the oppressors are in fact the money elites. But that is not voiced by the political leadership of either party. And the problem I'm trying to pose is that Trump will in fact, in fact, it terrifies me, this, this possibility, Trump will in fact ignite passion. It'll be misplaced, misdirected passion at, you know, Karen, I'm looking at you, at DEI and wokeness and, you know, uh, 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 treating these these other people ahead of us. That's a that's you know I've written about that elsewhere for you guys. Um, racial capitalism, as you say, it's also racial racialized politics, and it's so easy for demagogues to to play that. So if if Biden and the Democrats aren't singing a different tune, which is yes, they should acknowledge that it's it's in large part created out of the white supremacy background to, to the country. But then in fact, you white people, you know, are actually screwed by your landlord, your banker. If, 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 if that passion's not there, um, and you know, we're looking at polls that say that the people who are most out of it in terms of this, the stakes in this election are people in the, younger, lower income, people like I describe them in the article as demoralized. They're not, they're not, they're not fired up at all about this election. Many of them say, doesn't really matter. Why would I participate? It's not going to change. So, so um, you talk about, you talk about debt peonage and the debt-based economy. I, I guess my, my, my thought is that, you know, Delaware Joe is the no fundamental change candidate. So it's unlikely that he could do anything that you talk about. But beyond that, 
it's hard to know if there's any political figure aside from the small group of marginalized squad people who uh, I think they're putting millions of dollars to try to unseat Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I mean, how, how do we ever get the morality into our political system that you talk about? I don't think it can originate from within the existing system. There need to be enough voices outside of it who say in ways large and small, this is not only broken, but it's exceedingly, the brokenness is exceedingly dangerous now because it 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 forms the backdrop to a, to a failing democracy and uh, incipient uh, fascism. The problem with the arrival of fascism and, you know, Adam Gop, Gopnik wrote about this recently, a lot of people have been talking about it, is uh, it creeps up on you on account of the disengagement and account of the not paying attention, not not taking it seriously until it's there, until it's there. And then everything is foreclosed. I mean, some of my, uh, I say this to you at LA Progressive, some of my ultra leftist friends who are older also take the view, this is traditional on the parts of the left, well, It'll 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 induce the crisis, the final crisis. You know, the final battle will come when, you know, when Hitler's in power. The German left said that, right? Not Hitler uns. I am so profoundly against that. At the at the at the at the minimum, we have to buy time to prevent our version of of Hitler, and that means. I mean, I'm trying to say in my article, Delaware Joe should be elected, right? But he's not helping himself. He is not helping himself by being so insipid on, you know, the elephant in the room, which is uh, a, a system that's crushing people at the, you know, at everywhere below the 80 percent percentile. All right. So I'm retired, but through the grace of God, I'm not poor. There's going to be a whole lot of retired people soon. We were talking about this before we started recording. Uh, a whole lot of retired people soon who are going to be, you know, hard pressed. And in terms of um, the failures of the healthcare system, which is also, I would say, uh, a reflection of the debt economy, investors, right, buying up whole systems, you know, practices, emergency rooms all over the country are you know, people who go to emergency rooms don't know this, but they're, you know, emergency room LLC, you know, they're, they're, they are, you know, you know, they're extractive. They're extractive, and it, me, I feel like I should be one of those people in a cartoon, you know, and with a sign saying, "Not the end is near, but but capitalism's end is near." If you would wake up, right? Um, you're you're asking a really hard question. How do we rekindle this within an existing system? Uh, the way I think history works is that sometimes. Sometimes Occupy began to do this, and you were part of it. You remember that? Uh, oh, Occupy yes, began absolutely. to. Sometimes something happens that opens a window. And I should also say, and I didn't put this in the article, but the ultra rich, the global ultra elite, there's nothing that scares them more than the idea that they're that the system will be unveiled, that the system will be revealed. They they live in fear. I have a little quote here. From a thing by Benjamin Wallace Wells in the New York Times, you know he writes this uh, post-normal, these post-normal articles. He writes a lot about climate change. He says many of the world's richest people have rapidly become some of the most outspoken critics of the establishment and status quo, which they believe is almost uniformly arrayed against them. In other words, they're saying that even the little bit of woke we have is a you know mortal threat to right. their way of life their five homes and their private planes and their yachts. Right. Wow. But, um, you know, so I, I, so and I, I, ra I raised that to say that with eruptions here and there, suddenly you can sometimes have a chain reaction and a, and a, and a call it a reckoning, right? With the system. Yeah. But you know, we I, can... hope it's, I hope it happens in our lifetimes. Well, we can look at um, the Occupy movement, which uh, many people thought was a failure. I don't think it was a failure. I think that it was an opportunity 
to um, awaken a, a whole generation of people. And it's still going on right now. But if you look at situations like the Arab Spring, my fear is that we are getting toward the end of capitalism and we're in the final stages of capitalism. And if we don't build some other kind of system that is there for when this thing collapses, that we could go the way of Arab Spring. And, um, and, and really that's the fear because we've normalized this. You mentioned um, how capitalism is, is counter. It, it is the opposite actually of freedom. It is the opposite of democracy. Of all the systems, capitalism actually gives us the least amount of freedom. And it happens over time. The, accum the accumulation of power and wealth in the hands of a very few takes away the power and the freedom of the masses. So, so what do you think about that? We, we want to buy ourselves some time, but we've got to do something while we're buying this time. We've got to build something. Yeah, yeah and we have to network uh, these voices uh, because that's how that's how change happens. It's not just an eruption here and eruption there, but you know, it's 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 you know, what has Gaza to do with redlining in the United States? It has everything to do with it. I mean, that kind of awakening. Um, uh, uh, I think is happening and can happen, and social media can can assist it. But think of the power behind that is completely behind the idea, contrary to what you just said. You just said the truth, which is capitalism. Our kind of capitalism is unfreedom. Think of the the amount of power behind the ideation that capitalism, in fact, is the only basis for freedom. It's the epitome of freedom. They call it free enterprise for a reason. And I can't tell you, I mean, I'm in the so-called liberal community, that idea is so well rooted that, you know, my, you know, uh, high educated white liberal friends, if I had them here now for a cocktail party and went around the room, they'd be like, oh, but think about the alternative. The alternative is Stalinism. Well, that's propaganda, obviously. That's capitalist propaganda, but it's very, very powerful, and it's in here. That's right. It is in here. And it's in there um, mostly. When I think of unfettered capitalism, I think of slavery. Um, my, my daughter, for her junior year, she went to school in India for a while, and she called me and where they have unfettered capitalism. She says, you know, Mom, in the markets, they have various... Um, qualities of rice and beans that you can buy it's just in some of the, the the lowest price ones when you go and take a scoop out it's full of maggots you think it's rice but it's maggots because they have no controls it's just uh unfettered laissez-faire you you know buyer beware you just and so to me that type of capitalism um really represents the opposite of what freedom of what freedom is. And I think it's most people who come from oppressed people feel the same way. Here's another thing, uh, Sharon and Dick, that, that I think could help us. I use the word consistently extractive uh, in the article, and I do that by design because I want people to increasingly think of the extraction of wealth and the extraction of fossil fuels in the same frame, because they are, in fact, in the same frame. Now, we know, historically, this particular system of extractive capitalism is about 500 years old. It's in the total span of human experience, it's like this, but it's put the, the planet in peril. It's, it's, it's caused, you know, almost all modern wars, at least, are about who can extract and that goes back, again, 500 years to the opening of the Western Hemisphere by European colonizers. Again, an extractive system that claimed for itself innocence, claimed for itself God, right? I mean, we're here to help you. That's what they said. I, so, they, so, uh, so, so, uh, and I say that all to, all, all to say that if the young people who are uh, uh, totally committed to stopping catastrophic climate change, understand the connection between extractive 
uh, fossil fuel industries and the heart of finance capitalism, that's a, that's that's big because capitalism, in a way, literally can't sustain itself. Right. So, uh, you know, a, a bit ago you were talking about uh, the need for a, a some kind of explosive event. Uh, I think we've talked about it that that through presidential directives and laws passed in, in Congress, we're not going to make the significant change we need. We're putting band-aids on a, on a, on a bleeding corpse, but we've had some, some, uh, you know, large events, the Trayvon Martin shooting that birthed Black Lives Matter that, that gained some real strength for a while. Occupy, obviously, kind of really caught the attention of the country. I would say George Floyd murder. The problem with those things is there's there's countervailing forces that don't want them to have too much effect. I mean, anti uh, DEI is 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 a small piece of it, but but it's also the fact that we don't have a strategy, a well thought out sure. strategy, to take advantage of the next great disruption because certainly. In this world, there'll be another great disruption. I don't know if Gaza will be it or the next thing. I'm going to say something that will not make me popular at certain parts of uh, Bel Air and um, Brentwood, but um, uh, a big problem is uh, left philanthropy is content with simply what I call virtue signaling. Yeah, we're funding this, you know, this. Uh, feminist something, or we're funding this uh, Black Lives Matter thing, or we're funding this. Um, and they don't have a strategy for dismantling capitalism because they're capitalists, yeah. right? if you follow, yes. right? Yes. Uh, mind you, their philanthropy is tax subsidized by, you know, truck drivers and uh, house cleaners. Uh, you know, the, the, this whole, uh, this whole uh, efflorescence of family foundations that actually don't do anything, but allow really rich people to send their kids to college. And, you know, I mean, they're completely unregulated, right? Um, it's a whole boutique thing now. Law firms and financial advisors, uh, why don't you have a family foundation? That'll help you out. You don't have to do anything, you know, but you can act like you like you are. That's right. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a scandal. It is a, unbelievable amounts of money that are unavailable for public purposes, because of private philanthropy. So they meet, they go to their their little retreats in Aspen and, and all kinds of little spa towns and talk about the good that they're doing. Uh, and they're part of the parasitic problem. Now, they do give some money to good causes. And and back when I had to raise money for PCU and other organizations, I, I was there with my begging bowl and I was sucked up to them. But in fact, the whole the whole system is despicable. And right. it's part of the it's part of the corruption. So it's it's part of the the nonprofit industrial complex, yep. and there's a term: the revolution will not be funded. We know yeah, exactly. that we right. can't really have fundamental change if we're relying on the ultra wealthy to fund this change. It's not going to happen. Yeah, uh, I, I I can never say the guy's name, but that Anand uh, Giranda, I can never quite say it right. But his book, he was on the inside of the Park Avenue and. You know West Hollywood funded funding community, and he 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 really he, he let him have <laughs> let him have it. I'm laughing, but it's it's horrible. I mean, it's horrible. So they're not interested in having uh, movements working together with the labor movement, you know, on fundamental change and with a with a fundamental understanding that it's racial capitalism that has to go. Again, why would they? They're not they're not feeling the heat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so so that kind of philanthropy is really designed to ease the pain, not cure the patient. Right, yeah. right. It's it's it's. Uh, if I can be all biblical on you, I can say Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah says, uh, uh, "They're healing the wounds of my people lightly." That is to say, they're they're they they're pretending. They're pretending to care. Yes. In well, fact, you, you know, you can you can take a lot off your taxes if you just put a sign up that says "I care." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Peter, you know, you're you're always uh, giving us uh, stuff to chew on, and we really do appreciate it. Uh, we try to 
partner with, work with people who are of um, the same mind. We certainly want to continue to support you and what you're doing. And maybe one day we will see a progressive movement, a movement that is going to provide the kind of infrastructure that we are going to, we desperately need right now. But I have a feeling that in the short term, we're going to need it even more. Right. And I remain hopeful. I don't want to give you the impression I'm not hopeful. I was, I was, uh, uh, truly inspired by the, younger people of all ages who were in this gathering in Philadelphia who are clearly, you know, they, they, they understand the existential nature of this, right. In a, in a, in a, in a visceral way, there is the energy on the ground in all every conceivable kind of movement, even here in sleepy little Rhode Island, you know, that we've got a, uh, predatory debt coalition, we've got an environmental racism coalition, really good people doing really good things. They are in and out of the legislature, but they're not, they're never in the state house together, right? In one big force. And uh, and I do say at the end, I say, well, you know, maybe at some point the religious community will will realize its own prophetic foundations and start talking about these things. Let's hope. So thank you so much, Peter. We'll thank talk you. to you again the next time you bless us with another article. Well, here you go. You're talking all preacher-like. All right. <laughs> Love you guys. Love you too. Bye-bye. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.